Welcome to Duck Season Somewhere Podcast. This episode is brought to you by the following sponsors. GetDucks.com, your proven source for the very best waterfowl hunting adventures. Argentina, Mexico, six whole continents worth. For two decades, we've delivered real duck hunts for real duck hunters. And ushuntlist.com because the next great hunt is closer than you think. Search our database of proven U.S. and Canadian outfits. Contact them directly with confidence. Trust is earned. By the numbers, 121 waterfowl subspecies bagged on six continents, 20 countries, 36 U.S. states, and growing. I spend upwards of 225 days per year chasing ducks, geese, and swans worldwide. And I don't choose shotguns for their brand name or the cool factor. Y'all know me way better than that. I've shot Benelli for over two decades. I continue shooting Benelli shotguns for their simplicity, utter reliability, and superior performance. Whether hunting near home or halfway across the world, that is the stuff that matters. Sit means sit and stay until it doesn't. No matter how well or how often trained, retrievers want those ducks as badly as we do, maybe even more. Char dog might be titled, but she's still just a dog. I'm over 50 years old, and I still do dumb stuff, trust me. Retrievers are family. I wouldn't endanger my children near heavy traffic, and I'm not going to risk my dog jumping in front of blazing guns either. Gundog Outdoors' patented quick-release safety system is fully adjustable, tethers to any blind or stand, has titanium stakes for frozen ground, and a quick-release marine-grade shackle to quickly release Fido when the smoke clears. Visit gundogoutdoors.com. Connect with them on Instagram at Gundog Outdoors to see their growing line of gun dog safety and performance products. Enter hashtag get ducks to receive 15% discount off of your first order. Ball Shot Shell's copper plated bismuth tin alloy is the good old days again. Steel shots come a long way in the past 30 years, but will never, ever perform like good old fashioned lead. Say goodbye to all that gimmicky, high-recoil, compensation, science, hype, and hello to superior performance. Know your pattern. Take ethical shots. Make clean kills. That is the boss way. The good old days are now. It really is duck season somewhere for 365 days from Duck season somewhere takes me year-round to a worldwide destination where I visit with the most interesting people. I'm your host, Ramsey Russell. Join me here to listen to those conversations. Welcome back to Duck Season Somewhere. I am in Montana. I'm, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes east of Billings, sitting in a cabin overlooking the beautiful Yellowstone River where we duck hunted this morning. Uh, what a real treat. Today's guest is Bruce Kanya that runs a company called Floating Island International. Very, very interesting subject. How are you today, Bruce? Doing great, Ramsey. How about you? Oh, I, 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 if I was any better, I'd still be sitting in the duck blind. Yeah, that, that was a lot of fun this morning. You sure started off early, you know. You know, here 45 minutes before legal, just to yeah. get out wade, wading out there towards the, the main channel. Well, for a for a for a flatlander to to wade down that <clears throat> that goat trail. To the river itself, and then across those slippery rocks, uh, we got set up a little bit after legal. By the time we got set up, and we didn't have too much. We took a half dozen goose decoys and three or four duck floaters, but it worked out beautifully. It was just, it, it was, it, I would say this morning at sunrise may have been one of the most beautiful mornings duck hunting I've ever experienced. It, it, it was just, it was something about being out on that river this morning was beautiful, gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Bruce, where where are you? Uh, what's your story? Where are you originally from, and and how did this start? Well, I I was um, born and raised in Wisconsin, and in fact, uh, uh, the uh, place called Marinette County up north of Green Bay, mm-hmm. my home base, and in fact uh, went to college at the uh, University of Wisconsin Madison. Oh. And while while doing that, I um, I had the kind of a a fun job actually. I I started a recreation tabloid. Uh, I enjoyed writing about hunting and fishing, and that's what it was about. 
I'll be, did you ever heard of a guy named Aldo Leopold? <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> yeah, uh, sort of an icon when it comes to the environment. Yeah, oh, yeah. The father of wild, wildlife management came from right there to the university you went to. You were telling me earlier, <clears throat> I asked you, did you did you grow up duck hunting out in Wisconsin? And I know you're an avid hunter now. Uh, tell us about growing up in Wisconsin. You know, we had a, a neighbor who, my, I, you know, I have five brothers, no sisters. Kind of an unusual family makeup. But um, three of the brothers, including me, enjoyed hunting. And, and, you know, we're certainly passionate about getting out in any possible way we could. Um, and had a neighbor who um, I ran into at one point. I think I might have been nine or ten, but he was shooting a bow. Oh! And of course, I was totally in, you know, intrigued. And, and uh, with his guidance over time, ultimately I uh, developed uh, uh, around bow hunting, especially. Um, and along the way, my, my grandmother actually taught me how to snare rabbits with really? with uh, that multi-stranded picture hanging wire. So yeah. I'd have a paper out and, and uh, run my snare line at the same time. Uh, there, there were times I'd come back with well, almost as much weight in rabbits as I had with newspapers at the beginning of the route. I'll be darned. I, that's, that's, I, well, I wonder where she learned to do that. Maybe like depression air or stuff, just yeah, revival? Or? Really, in fact, yeah. The, she and her family had been raised uh, uh, up in Phillips, uh, which is northern Wisconsin. And ran a uh, lumber mill, as I recall. Hmm. But that's really wild country. That's up there towards uh, Flambeau Flowage and some of the uh, remarkable musky water that happens in northern Wisconsin. Were you a big musky fisherman? Yeah, I, I, uh, when, as I was running that recreation tabloid, it was a wonderful opportunity to advers- advertise myself as a musky guide. Oh really? Uh, you know, I just uh, I, you were telling some stories about your son here a while ago and, <laughs> and his entrepreneurial spirit. Well, we have some of that going on, but uh, certainly not at the level your son seems to to have taken it. Yep. Now that talking about that entrepreneurial spirit, y'all obviously he's talking about the Dunkinator who uh, sold bobcat feet and turtles and everything else in in high school. What what did you uh when you talk about the uh the, the rabbits and the archery? What about the waterfowl? Were there a lot of waterfowl out there? I remember, in fact, uh, that gentleman that taught me how to hunt. At one point, uh, he had a German uh, short hair, and we were bow hunting in the neighborhood. You know, you'd, uh, you'd get along a railroad track, for example, and hunt the cover to either side of the track and and uh, looking for pheasant and rabbit and whatever we could find. But at one point, we came onto a pond, and there was a duck. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, that became a you know the, the the my my launch into the duck hunting world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, shooting at it with bows and arrows, uh, yeah. and ultimately collecting a, a, a small blue wing tail, as I recall. What is wow a blue wing tail with archery? Now, when I was a little boy, I'd go out and try to shoot robins, uh, which I've since learned was illegal. But you just go out and shoot robins with a stick and string, and I I was about one for hundred arrows slung at them. To, to uh, hit one, uh, hit a duck on the water is something else. How'd you get your arrows back? Yeah, even with massive flu flus, uh, I remember once doing a a duck and pheasant hunt at my brother's uh, operation. He run, was running a dog kennel, and and uh, they had uh, uh, a neighboring farm that grew waterfowl and pheasant, and, and they would uh, uh, for the this particular uh, time. We were interested in developing a hunting video around archery for ducks and pheasants. Mm-hmm. Boy, look what's coming over us right now, Ramsey. Not, not, I, I can't hear God, what he's talking about. We're sitting here overlooking the Yellowstone River, and there's about 100, 100, 100 to 150 big Canada geese flying over. Yeah, it's a bit of a bluebird day, and they're flying high. But there'll be times over the course of the winter when we get them coming over the bluff here, you know, 50 yards up. Um, reasonable range relative to uh, old side by side ten gauge one and three quarter ounce triple B's. You know. <laughs> yeah. Do you hand load those or no? No, I don't. Uh, yeah. I'm able well, to find them. Well, you were telling me this morning that uh, as, as we were out there hunting. We had really one. We waited on these birds to come back. They sat out in the field all day apparently, but uh, we did have one single come by. Just. 
I'm gonna save seventy, eighty yards. And you said, "Well, why didn't you shoot him?" And now I know why. <laughs> now I know why you shoot him. Yeah, now I get it. We didn't even raise our guns. We just watched him fly over. And uh, where were we? Talking about talking about uh, where were we? Well, you know about the the uh, duck the initial duck hunting. That's right, the initial yeah. duck hunting. And it, you know, one time that you know my my brother and I took off for lacrosse and we hunted opener. Uh, on the Mississippi River there, um, and it was just an amazing experience. Uh, legal began at noon uh, at that point in time, and about quarter to twelve, all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. By f- by five to twelve, there was no break in the in the in the shooting. Mm. So many ducks happening. Uh, and the any, any game warden could have probably uh, done really well you know, yeah. uh, in that setting. But uh, I swear you could hold your arm out and watch BBs bounce off. I heard that. That must have been something that we've all been there, of course, back when we were little boys. You know, I was in Wisconsin not too long ago uh, with a friend, and he started talking about musky fishing. Is that like a pike? You know, we don't have that fish down south. Yeah, the, the musky uh, and the musky lunge or the tiger musky, which is a hybrid between musky and pike, um, they are uh, an incredible uh, fish. You know, as we were talking about earlier, we talked about that Florida strain largemouth bass. That's right. That gets really cagey and hard to catch. Hard to catch. Well, I've seen settings uh, where uh, literally – you could bomb a uh, um, you know a 45 50 inch musky that you could see from the boat why the water clarity was such that you could actually see that fish out there you could throw everything in the world on top of him and by him uh and maybe at some point it might it might be the 45th time he gets irritated and slashes at that big old bobby bait or just trying to get rid of is annoying him two pound suic uh, you know there's some of the old classic lures we used to throw at him but big what, lures, yeah, big, and in fact, uh, you know the, the, you could you could you know and have a client come to you and he's literally just muscle bound, uh, massive shoulders, uh, and he gets out there and he's throwing one of them two pound baits for a couple thousand cast while I'm guiding him. Uh, you can appreciate where those muscles come from. But that's a big that's a big trophy then. I mean that that, that it's not a it's not a sport, a sport fish in terms of. Making the grease hot. Guys right there to catch those just big tiger musky trophies. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, as I recall, the they had to be over 30 inches just to keep them. My goodness. Are there any out here in Montana? Yeah, we have a couple planted in uh, different lakes across the okay. state. We have some lakes that hold musky, but not many. During lunch, you were telling me about... Um, Y'all had gotten into wanting to film some, and we had talked about this previously before those geese flew over. You talked about wanting to do some filming, and I thought that was pretty incredible how you uh, invented back then and, and had this had this camera set up. Yeah, and, and this would have been the second half of the 80s, and I was just getting into the business of invention um, and certainly very uh uh, in love with archery, uh, both tournament archery and, and shooting. I'd, I'd shoot a compound bow, but bare bow without pins. And um, But anyway, the uh, one idea developed at that time, there was a, a floating plate device that um, it, we built and, and threaded into the riser of a compound bow. And then you could uh, slap a, an 8-millimeter camcorder on top of that. And the floating plate system would keep you from blowing up the camcorder. Mm-hmm. And back then, you're getting about 30 frames per second. It might be the same yet. I don't know. Uh, but uh, so when you would literally hit the tape run button and it takes a few seconds to engage. And, and then when you shoot, uh, you can actually see four or five or six frames of footage tracking the arrow flight. Really? So you'd you'd want big, puffy flu-flus uh, to help the camera find the arrow and be able to see it because you're just looking at the back end of the arrow with the camera's perspective. What date are we looking at? I mean, what when on a timeline are we looking at you having invented this system? The I think 80s? it would have 
86, 87, right in there. And, and cameras weren't cameras weren't the size of an iPhone back then, or even even these tiny little palm held. They, they, these were, as I remember back in the eighties, they were big. Uh, looked like a big old tape recorder or something. I mean, these were big <laughs> cameras, Bruce. Yeah, yeah. In fact, we we called we, we developed a name for this call. We called it Huntography, and you could actually, you know, one of our stories is uh, you, you can identify a huntographer because one of his arms is longer than the other. <laughs> from that, yeah, from carrying that. Tell me, tell me, uh, uh, tell us about your shooting that pheasant at that time coming down the line because I, I, I'd really. Uh, Fed, your your wife was telling me earlier today uh, as we were out here before lunch. She was talking about uh, the timing on ducks versus pheasants, and sometimes she's not dialed in for the other. And she's been having trouble with pheasants. And then after lunch, you were talking about shooting with a bow and arrow back when. Yeah, and, and, and uh, we again we're we're really you know promoting the the uh, sales for this uh, huntography mount. Sure. Uh, so we wanted to do an action packed video. And, uh, you know, my brother's place with the ducks and, and the pheasants. And at one point, we're doing a skirmish line through some cover when a rooster gets up on the far end. And uh, uh, we've got arrows. Whoosh, 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 you know, the, but the bird was doing fine until it's literally 15 or 18 feet in front of my camera. I'm holding out. I'm at full draw. When an arrow comes from the side, a bird arrow with uh, those loops on it. Hits the rooster. There's a cloud of feathers, but the bird powers through it, mm-hmm. keeps going. Now he's 20 yards out. Look, Ramsey. Oh, right there, more geese, guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that lower flight there. Those are shootable with that uh, 10 gauge system. I believe so. But anyway, uh, I I get a you know the final shot on the bird and the connect. So actually two uh, hits on a pheasant arrow in flight. Uh, video footage of it too. I think we called that video "Huntography Profile Number One." Wow. Went on and went commercial with it many, many years ago, though. Did y'all do well with it? I sold it to a gentleman. Uh, I licensed it to a gentleman. <clears throat> that kind of launched me into the the business model of licensing inventions instead of doing the hard work of production. That seems like the smartest way to do inventions. If you want to live in Montana, anyway, you know, yeah. because we're not really an industrial center. We're not close to the big volume markets or any of that. Um, but I sure do, dearly love living here. <laughs> oh, I can see why. I, you, your view is, 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 is to die for. you got this skeet, this skeet machine jumping out over the river and geese flying back and forth while we're recording in this beautiful view. Uh, it, it, I can see why you like Montana. Yeah, and, you know, there's another, there's another story with that with that uh, camcorder system. Um, I'm up elk hunting at one point. Uh, it's late September. Uh, I'm in that dark timber uh, up north of White Sulphur Springs area in the Little Belts, and um, you know, it's it been up from well before dawn. And uh, here I am in this nice, cool, shady area, and there's a patch of sunlight up against a tree. And I thought, well, I'm gonna lay down and take a nap. I'd been calf calling, cow calling on my way in, and it just stank of elk, you know, that wonderfully umami smell of right. of elk in the rut. Uh, so, you know, five minutes later, though, I'm, I'm not falling asleep. You know how you can be tired at times, but yeah. just don't fall asleep. So I got bored, and I get up, and I'm brushing myself off when about 12 foot away is a, a mountain lion. It had been sneaking up on what it thought was a calf elk. You me. And I get up and I don't look like a calf elk. And I've got this contraption in my hand, you know, the bow and arrow and, and a camcorder in front of it. Uh, so I, I hit the tape run button and in this deathly silent spot, you, you, could, you could hear a whisper, the, the buzz whir of the eight millimeter camcorder. Uh, anyway, I hit that, that uh, you know, it, it takes about three seconds to engage I wanted to capture the event, you know, whatever happened. Uh, <laughs> These are my last moments. <laughs> but, but that cat was huge, and it had a totally white face. I'm guessing it was a very, very old animal. Yeah. But it spun and ran, and before 
the three, you know, within the three second period, I kept the camcorder the pointed on the animal as it was running through the timber, uh, but I didn't get a single frame of footage. That's how fast the cat was. Right, and how slow the cameras were back in the end. That too. That maybe maybe that's what woke you up. Maybe your sixth sense went off and you just realized that. I mean, that's perfect timing that you wake up when a mountain lion's fixing to have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you know what what how did you end up uh because you were out here elk hunting how did you end up out here from wisconsin well the um uh, i was in relationship at the time and my wife was uh uh eager to try something different and i I'd, I'd been running a, a recreation tabloid back in wisconsin while going to college and and uh, it was right after college. So ultimately, my wife wanted to move west, and that brought us to Billings, Montana. Mm-hmm. Lived in Bozeman for a couple of decades, and now I'm back here to Shepherd, Montana on the Yellowstone. Did uh, did you ever guide or anything when you moved out here and, and, and do any work in wildlife? Yeah. In fact, in, when living in Bozeman, I was guiding bow hunters up in that country, and uh, especially in the Madison Valley area, had some favorite uh, ground to hunt up in that country uh, near Cowboy Heaven. Uh, that'll be a place that some avid elk hunters or a name they'll recognize. I can I can see where had I come out west, come out here to this region when I was young, I'd have stayed. I'd have gotten <laughs> used to the winters, and there's there's no way I'd have left and gone home. You mentioned uh, earlier today. Bruce about um, the business of of inventing and we talked about the huntography um, we're going to talk about one of the other products but what other inventions have you had I mean you is that is that is that how you define are you an inventor well that's how I've made my living over the years I ultimately I uh, I've got a prosthetic leg on my left side and uh, below knee and it doesn't limit me now like it did back then Mm -hmm. and that truly motivated me uh, this is back in the 80s again uh, to to work on uh, figuring out a way to enjoy the remarkably soft uh, material that was being used at the time for uh, bicycle seats Ah, that gel some form of a thermoplastic gel but ultimately, one of my my best inventions in terms of of return on investment and cash you know cash flow uh, was a liner for the residual limb of an amputee. Uh, you could put this on and it made walking and running and everything else possible again because it would dampen the uh, uh, the shock associated with walking in a prosthetic device. I can see that. I'm going to talk to you a little bit later after the podcast about something similar on that. But, you know, a lot of people come up with great ideas. I mean, I think of them all the time. But, And I I didn't intend to ask you this question as we started the podcast. But now I'm now wondering, what, what's the difference in someone like yourself and someone listening or someone like me that has an idea and then actually does something with it? What would you say, what would, you say would be the difference? And taking and taking not just an idea, Bruce, but several ideas you've taken to full success. You know, um, I think it uh, uh, probably one word that explains most of it, and that would be persistence. Mm-hmm. Staying with it, keeping on nudging it, prodding it, you know, uh, moving along. Moving and, along, and Keep moving. you know, the the prototype process is energizing. You can see, literally, you can ultimately track um, your ability uh, to to get commercial, to get to the point where you've got something people are going to want to buy. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, our main, my main business now as an inventor is the floating island business. Right. And I, 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 I project that we built some 400 prototypes before we got to what we went commercial with. So you can appreciate my... Um, my, uh, when I hear people, um, uh, look at our product 
and, and you know, the Biohaven floating island and say, hey, I can do that at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they're talking with me, I'll, I'll suggest to them that it might take a few prototypes to get to the same place. Right. Yeah. It's, it's the nature of invention. It makes sense. Um, products evolve, and they're supposed to. That's right. That, that, that's exactly right. Nothing stays static. It, it, it's always an evolution to, of, of progression and getting better and more improved and more efficient and stuff like that. Tell me, tell me how you got into. Uh, well, well, let me let me back up just just a second because uh, I've known you and Ann for a while. I mean, it, it was it was quite a while ago. I'd say it was ten years ago. Y'all called and, and we got to know each other, and, and y'all went to New Zealand. Uh, on an extended trip, shot ducks and geese, and I think she has some family there. And and I remember, uh, I remember your email was floating, floating island. Uh, uh, you had an email very similar to that that denoted, and I'm like, what the heck, a flying uh, floating island? Yeah. And uh, but but how did how did you come up with this idea? Because I know it had something to do with a uh, a red dog. Yeah, the the red dog story. Um, Actually, the dog was black. His name is Rufus. Oh. <laughs> I inherited him, inherited him from, um, from well, yeah, uh, that's in the background. But ultimately, I, here was Rufus. He was two years old. The dog had charisma. You know, he's one of those dogs that people come over oh, here yeah. to see Bruce, but I think they really came to, you know, to reconnect with Rufus. Uh-huh. Yeah, awesome pup. But, um, you know, I I uh, had purchased this particular farm uh you know some a few hundred acres and um immediately put a pond in because i i wanted to uh invent and work around water water and agriculture you know where they where they connect where they interface Mm -hmm. i put this pond in using ditch water from a local irrigation ditch and late that summer, Rufus is out there swimming in his pond, and he comes back into the shore, shakes himself off. Within a few minutes, his his black dog hair takes on a reddish hue. Oh, okay. I, I swear you could smell him from 50 feet upwind. The, What's going on it there? was uh, Anyway, I had friends at uh, uh, Montana State University, people that worked there at the Center for Biofilm Engineering. And... Uh, I, I went to them for help you know, to understand, you know, what's going on here. You know, I live in Montana. We're we're a headwater state. Uh, water should be wonderfully clean, clean and pristine. But what was going on is that the nutrients associated with that farm water, that irrigation water, uh, given the right conditions, explode into harmful algae blooms. Uh, and we're seeing so much of that around the the world right now. So the but but uh, the cyanobacteria is associated with that uh, harmful algae. It's a form of it, uh, and it was what was producing that remarkable stench. That's where the red dog came from. Right, because it became red. It's not only color, but it was it was uh, odorous. Absolutely. Wow, and and that that had to do with. Uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of, of lot of uh, nutrient overload co- runoff coming in from agriculture. Some of their fertilizer and stuff like that was driving this this system towards that. Yeah, uh, and in fact, uh, that experience motivated me to learn and understand and invent around water quality. And for for me, the breakthrough, Ramsey was. The um, I didn't even have a word for it back then. Now we do. But the breakthrough was when I started thinking about where I used to go to experience the very best water. Mm-hmm. Places like Chippewa Flowage in northern Wisconsin, home of the world record muskie, mm-hmm. also home to many, many dozens of huge, naturally occurring floating islands, including one 30-acre island that we've uh, I've, I've hired... Uh, you know, ex special forces, master divers to get underneath and in the dangerous diving conditions to understand those islands and how they were in their makeup. Uh, we would core them. Uh, we, and, and I remember one time 
we're there and we thought, well, let's interview every fishing boat we come to today on this 18,000 acre reservoir. And we ultimately came up on 11 different boats, nine of which were fishing the perimeter of these floating islands. Why? When you snorkel or dive along the perimeter, it becomes real obvious why. It's like an incredible, it's like a, a floating fish factory. The, oh, the, the nutrients in Chippewa flowage are being cycled into and through these massive filters, these naturally occurring islands. And those nutrients are, are transitioning into a form. Uh, it's called the technical term, diatom-based paraphyton. But those nutrients cycle into this material that's an alternative to cyanobacteria an alternative to blue-green algae, and, and it grows fish. So here's the, the, the real home run is this. If you've got water that is impaired, too many nutrients, and today is growing algae, you have the option, you have the ability to take those same nutrients and grow fish with them instead. The key word to do that is stewardship. Mm-hmm. Biomimicry, nature as model. Yeah. Wow. So where did you go? You, you, you're, you're, you're thinking about this, this, this Chippewa flowage and these natural floating islands that somehow formed and, and, and took a life of their own. And, uh, and, and so you came up with your idea to mimic it and, and build one out. Now, uh, I know looking at your slides, uh, floating duck blind. <laughs> and, and you've got, I mean, but but you've got, so you've got this. Uh, it could be, it could be a, it could be a boat dock. It could be something, but it's far more sophisticated. As you were showing me some of the uh, the substrate you use, but it floats, and uh, but it, it's more than a, a a a floating dock or a boat blind. It's way more than that. It, it, because, because you've got this this substrate and you've got this system that begins to take literally a life of its own. You're absolutely right. You know, and and over the course of those 400 prototypes. We were ultimately trying to biomimic nature's wetland effect. Mm -hmm. Nature's wetland effect, uh, that combination of surface area, which is what our filter material, which is what we make the islands out of, uh, provides. And you combine that with circulation aeration, and you've got nature's, you've you've just uh, essentially replicated how nature does it in terms of cycling nutrients into healthy forms of life. Where did where did you come up with the idea of coming up with that uh, that that synthetic filter material that you use? That, that, that that's incredible. Because and and, and so you said something to me this morning, Bruce. Um, as I was walking around looking for a walker stick, so I didn't slip. I said, I bet the bottom of that river slippery. You go, oh yeah, it's slippery. And you used a you used a scientific name, a foot long. Uh, it just basically means slippery. Uh, yeah. But anyway, what how does that all play into this? Well. The, the very base of the food web in fresh water is one of the, there's going to be a, a, a plant form, a plant based life form, uh, you know, phytoplankton. Uh, and there's going to be a, uh, what's called a heterotrophic life, life form. Uh, and that would be biofilm generating microbes. Microbes and their residue. What's left over when they die forms biofilm, and biofilm is the base material for that long word you were talking about, paraphyton. Okay. Now, when you do that, when you grow paraphyton, you're essentially growing an alternative to harmful algae blooms. I got you. I got you. So you went through 400 prototypes, and y'all came up with this model of a floating island. What? Then what? what? What do you use it for besides a, a duck blind? I mean, you know, I mean, seriously, I know you've got, there, there's a lot of uses and a lot of countries now that are embracing your technology. Yeah. In fact, uh, as of now, we're over 9,000 biohavens launched around the world. Wow. Uh, we've got half a dozen manufacturers building them, each of which has their own territory. And then... Uh, my company, Floating Island International, is a master distributor, so we market to the rest of the world. And some of the applications, there's a really exciting one unfolding right now uh, in which floating photovoltaics, 
floating solar is happening. We can support solar panels on biohavens. Beyond that, we also have a wonderful application out there. We can dampen wave action with this system. So we can protect these solar floating solar systems uh, you know, in their, uh, let's imagine you're in a you know, large hydro power reservoir setting uh, and there's plenty of fetch and high winds. Well, that can truly influence the lifespan of that, of that solar array. Mm-hmm. So um, I envision biohavens being the protective perimeter for such systems. And because of their size and scale, uh, this ultimately represents a way to fix the harmful algae bloom potential connected with these large bodies of water. There really isn't any other scalable solution. Right. So now all of a sudden we're hitting on a scalable solution, something that could even go after places like Chesapeake Bay, Lake Erie. The Gulf of Mexico. You know, we've been through, um, we've been through a handful of direct hits by hurricanes already. Gotcha. And the product is resilient. We're surviving. We're through it. We went through a typhoon in Singapore at one point as well. Tornado right here. Um, what else? Oh yeah, a massive windstorm in Oregon where the winds got up to 160 miles an hour. Went on for a day and a half. Um, I remember a 48-inch snow dump, a place called Elfin Cove outside of Juneau, Alaska. We had islands there. Uh, So on the bottom of the islands, you've got this three- or four-inch crust of barnacles that uh, vector with this setting. They just love that filter material Mm -hmm. to latch onto. Then on top of the island, 48 inches. But because the biofilm being created within the matrix is in and of itself buoyant, the system's buoyancy was just fine. That's crazy. Well, you had, uh, over lunch, you had you'd also talked about uh, there was one you built for somebody that had some unbelievable amount of gravel for endangered species uh, nesting habitat. Yeah, it was a large habitat project for the U.S. government, um, Army Corps of Engineers. Mm-hmm. Uh, 40,000 square foot supporting 900 tons of gravel. Uh, as habitat for the Caspian Tern. That, that's just unbelievable. You know, here's the other thing that we're learning, Ramsey, that we're, we're, we're kind of scratching our heads about. But when you launch an island uh, in one measurement, 11 weeks later, you know, we do a dry weight, weight on the island, putting it in the water. Then we take it out we, and we put a, a core... Uh, known volume, and we get it down to, to dry weight again, and we discover that we've grown by some 72% in dry weight mass. So it weighs almost double what it weighed initially. Why? Because we're essentially learning how to grow humus. We're learning how to grow real estate. What does it do for water quality? Yeah, and that's and, our... And fish production. Uh, our primary... Uh, direction since 2005 when we launched commercially <clears throat> has been water quality enhancement. So we work in stormwater ponds or wastewater settings or natural fish ponds. Um, and what we're finding, Ramsey, is that the the islands are a way to launch nature's food web and to grow the preferred life forms that we ultimately all desire. Uh, they're we, we've we've got wonderfully uh, uh, dramatic even examples of islands as fish aggregating devices. Mm-hmm. You saw, in fact, on, a, on a, some of the slides, the the oh, incredible yeah. concentration of fish under the islands. Unbelievable! Yeah, we had a time here. You know, we had ten kids who were raising money for their school, uh, so they got a whole bunch of sponsors. One kid had fourteen sponsors, and they're all paying them a dollar for every fish he caught. Well, those 10 kids came out here on a Saturday morning in September, just a couple of years back, but they caught 634 fish in four and a half hours. Yeah, that that was a nice little fundraiser and a heck of a fish fry, I'm thinking. They raised some $10,000. Wow. Yeah. 
And and did you tell me that uh, Mississippi State University had actually done some research on fish productivity subsequent to these these islands being deployed? Yeah, we had a, a PhD student working on his his uh, thesis uh, under Dr. Wes Neal, mm-hmm. and they took a floating stream bed embodiment of island, and uh, in a nicely you know, scientific, controlled, independent, third party setting. Uh, learned that the system with the island in it generated 19% more fish biomass than the other systems. Mm-hmm. That's unbelievable. Uh, excuse me, then the control. I, sure. I need to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I knew what you meant. What did... Um, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking about a, a U.S. congressman or somebody talking about an island flipping over, and I didn't want to sound like this guy, but... But it did occur to me as I was looking at your films, and uh, have you ever had uh, like a light-seeded tree species become rooted uh, in, in some of these substrates? I mean, I, I can just imagine a willow tree or a cottonwood even or something taking root and getting so tall. But do, 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 will they grow? Do will they? Uh... Yeah, yeah. We've had. Uh, it, it's hard to find the plant that we can't propagate yeah. on the islands. But we bias towards native woody fibrous perennials, mm-hmm. uh, and you know again nature's model. Uh, however, there is a, a new science unfolding now around hyperaccumulator plants that can actually take up more than the proportionate amount of nutrients uh, that conventional uh, that occur in conventional life forms. There's another form of hyperaccumulator though, that's even more effective than plants, and that is fish. Oh. I'll give you an example. Um, you need some 1,100 pounds of filamentous algae to make up, uh, and this is on a, 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 let's call it a wet basis. I don't know how, how else to describe it, but it's algae that's been piled up and stacked and allowed to drain overnight. Uh, you need 1,100 pounds of that to, to pull out one pound of phosphorus. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, it only takes 105 pounds of northern yellow perch. Uh, the, uh, the, the yellow perch is a hyperaccumulator. Mm-hmm. And here on Fish Fry Lake, I don't know if you recall the, the photos of a perch, but yes. we get, you know, the, the biggest one we've weighed now is one pound 11 ounces. But uh, just the other day, I caught one that was probably about that weight uh, uh, and just incredibly fat and chunky. Uh, the size of the massive perch we used to catch off those uh, you know, off Lake Michigan, uh, growing up in the '60s. My goodness, where do you where do you see uh, where do you see this technology going in the future? Like you were saying earlier about uh, products continue to evolve and become better and more efficient. Where where do you see this moving forward? You know, I I have this dream of owning my own country yeah <laughs> well yeah build it sure 201 miles offshore you know? yeah um I, I it's a it's a dream and uh and ultimately uh i do think that the uh latching into the floating photovoltaic market will be our window to really large projects that can pay for themselves. A term for that is called water resource recovery. Um, so the idea of, of recovering value from the space on top of a reservoir uh, okay. by generating solar power, but concurrently as a byproduct, fixing the water, mm-hmm. preventing the HABs. Uh, think about drinking water reservoirs. They can get shut down when a harmful algae bloom occurs. That's right. That's right. Do you think? Do you think I've heard about some of these big dead zones out in the Gulf, out in out in the ocean? Uh, some of these problems. I've even heard about like the, these mass islands of uh, plastic particles. Uh, there, there's four major ones uh, out in the uh, out in the oceans in the Gulf streams. Do Do you see this kind of technology as potentially being a cure for either of those or both of those? Yeah. Thank you for that question. It It's uh, something that we have focused on for the last six or seven years now, but the t- 
tiny micro particles of plastic which make up the bulk of the plastics and the gyres that you're describing. Uh, they're a form of total suspended solid, the technical term, TSS. And we have worked up a design whereby we can, we, we call it the floating stream bed, but we can lift and, sight and, and um, lift water vertically and move it horizontally into and through an island. And that TSS bonds to the sticky biofilm. Mm-hmm. So it's a way to harvest it and use that TSS to ultimately become captured within the core of the island uh, and contribute to its ultimate size and scale. So it'd be, it'd be, it's entirely possible that you could do this technology. It's, and like you said, it's scalable enough now that we could, we could that humanity can tackle these problems using technology similar to what you've developed. You know, Ramsey, it's such a hopeful place to be. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we need. really energizing. Uh, and I'm I'm impatient, really, <laughs> to see these, you know, these uh, systems that can fix the huge waterways, the salt and seas of the world, you know, the, Gulfs of, the Gulf of Mexico uh, with its uh, dead zone. Dead zone. And, there, and, and I read in one article that there's some 390 other dead zones in marine settings. And those are simply, uh, they're, if, if they're happening, you go up watershed from them and you're going to find thousands and thousands of lakes that are impaired, uh, that are experiencing this nutrient pollution that ultimately causes them to run out of dissolved oxygen and not be able to sustain any kind of a healthy food web. Mm-mm. No, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, it's got to be fixed. It's got to be addressed sooner or later. Uh, and this, this isn't just uh, a duck hole off in the Delta. This, this, is, this is a global issue right here that uh, it's only getting worse, Bruce, as you well know. Folks, y'all been listening, listening to uh, Bruce Kanye, Floating Island International. Uh, his link is on the description. Um, I tell you, the people you meet while you're just out running around goose and duck hunting, huh? And we're fixing to go shoot some pheasants here in just a little bit. Uh, Bruce, thank you very much for coming on today. I really, now, One last question I just thought of. When you do build uh, your own country 200 miles offshore, will it be big enough to have some ducks and geese? Yeah, well, well I'll mention something curious, but fresh water is buoyant. It floats on top of seawater. Yeah. So not only will we have some waterfall habitat, but we'll have habitat appropriate for both marine and freshwater forms of waterfall. Sign me up. I'm, that's where I, that's, I, that's duck season somewhere, as we always say. There you I, go. I, I want to come <laughs> visit you. And, well, and we get to set our own season, uh, you know, desi- designate our own season. International you know, boundaries. Yeah. Yep. It'd be, be your country. There you go. Oh, yeah. Sign me up. I'm coming. Folks, thank you all for listening. Duck season somewhere. We'll see you next time.